Hey, next up, we've got David Tree. Hey, David, how you doing? Hi, Chris. Yeah, I'm good, thank you. How are you doing? Good. Well, give us a little background on yourself first. Uh, yes, so I'm the technical director um, at the Games and Visual Effects Research Lab at the University of Hertfordshire. Um, I'm also a uh, lecturer in uh, animation and games technology. Excellent. So what's today's presentation going to be about? So today's presentation, I'm going to be taking you through a few case studies from some recent research projects we've done in the lab um, using Houdini for things other than visual effects. So as a kind of pipeline tool between the real world and uh, games engines. And in the second half of the talk, I'm going to take you through our process uh, that we use for teaching artists how to uh, de design problem solutions. So writing their own tools, that kind of thing. Perfect. Well, let's get started. Okay. In this video, I'm going to talk to you about how we make use of the multi-tool that is Houdini in both our research and teaching in the School of Creative Arts at the University of Hertfordshire. Within the research lab, it is important that when we select a tool, that it can be adapted and moulded to fit the challenges that can occur during a research project. Often we don't have time to buy new software or to bring things online at quick levels. So adaptability is really important. Also because sometimes the software has not been invented yet. So we just need something that's powerful and has the ability to be molded to fit the challenges we're dealing with. So the beginning of this talk, I'm going to introduce you to our lab and also tell you about a few research projects we've been working on where Houdini has formed the central tool within their development. After that, I'm going to take you through some of the teaching um, that we've been doing in our technical direction and coding classes for our level five students during the digital animation degree um, and give you a, a, some insight as to how we're using Houdini for teaching problem solving and tool design. So the Games and Visual Effects Research Lab is a multidisciplinary team of researchers. Um, we're a mixture of programmers, uh, artists, animators, filmmakers, um, and we work on a variety of projects We've done some work on um, car visualization, medical visualization. Uh, we've even 3D printed dresses with, uh, in collaboration with fashion designers. This lab was originally founded um, as part of the North Sea Region Interreg Create Converge grant as funded by the EU, um, which enabled us to start looking at new areas of research around how we can use games and visual effects technology for non-entertainment purposes. And what's been quite exciting with this is we've just seen new and creative ways of using these techniques that we would never think of. And some of those, te uh, those techniques we've developed, we've brought back into our, um, into our practice as well. So some case studies I'm going to talk to you about today are Things from Another World, The Liberator Bomber Project, and Rendering Galactic Ghouls. So the first is a pipeline for converting virtual reality sketches into physical ornaments. The second is an offline LOD generation tool that enables large point clouds in Unreal Engine. And the final is looking at how we can use Houdini for faster visualization of astronomical uh, objects. As you can imagine, um, with these large data sets uh, astronomers deal with, they might be able to uh, visualize them with their own supercomputers, but one thing you can't do is have any artistic direction for the generation of cover art, for example. So without any more, let's get started at looking at uh, things from another world. So this project was developed in collaboration with Dr. Doris Polidoro, who's now in, uh, of the Cyprus University of Technology. Um, when we initially conceived this project, we were interested in seeing how um, artists of various disciplines, whether fashion designers, um, illustrators or animators, um, could create physical real world things by using virtual reality. And so we got ourselves a copy of Google Tilt Brush 
and we tra um, trained some students to teach these um, uh, various artists how to use the Tilt Brush software. And they each gave them about a half hour training session and then were encouraged to produce some form of three dimensional artifact. When these artifacts were exported, they come out as an FBX file with these thin planes. Now, while it works perfectly well on the 3D on the computer, it doesn't work very well when you go to 3D print it, because what we need is we need a continuous hull that is watertight. So the pipeline developed had to overcome several challenges. Um, the first challenge was how do we stick all the parts together? And the second was how do we make sure that um, it has sufficient thickness that it doesn't break apart? Now, this Houdini to the rescue, as we say. Um, and so after having a bit of a head scratch, we had to think and considered using a voxelization pipeline. So in the end, the solution was to um, actually convert these uh, planes into VDBs and then convert them back out um, as uh, polygons. And the nice thing about this was we were able to maintain a high quality of surface detail um, and it was nice and quick. The other thing was, that, of course, we had 20 or so people creating these artifacts. So trying to um, process them, we needed something that was easily repetitive um, without having to rebuild lots of scene files. Now, of course, something that Houdini is great for is building Houdini digital assets. So we built a HDA that would process our tilt brush X files and would export them as an STL that we could then stick into the 3D printer. So here's an example of some of the ones that were printed and they all came out um, really well in the end. Um, we only had a few items that uh, came off, but this was due to them being very, very fine in detail. Um, we actually had an exhibition of things from another world in our gallery. But this was just the, the, the fact that I was able, we were able to process these um, uh, models so quickly was down to the fact the way we set up our Houdini scene. It wouldn't have been possible using most of the other software that we would usually use. And of course, we let the artists have a bit of final direction and some of them painted them as well. That was the only element we didn't bring across because the printer we had doesn't print in color because it's a uh, laser sintering printer. The next project I'm going to talk about is the Liberator Bomber project. So this was developed in collaboration with the University of Dundee and again with Interreg North Sea Region Create Converge. In this project, we were looking at ways in which to get large point cloud data from LIDAR scans of underwater um, shipwrecks and airplanes and how to get those into um, a game engine so that we can explore them in virtual reality. So the advantage of using a tool such as Houdini, again, was that we were able to generate offline LODs, which uh, level of detail for those not initiated into the ways of games. Um, but what we generated was a series of LODs for each segment and then cut the whole thing up into small chunks so that in the game engine we could um, on the fly load them in and out. Now, while we tried other methods such as Python tools initially, um, they just weren't fast enough for processing the hundreds of millions of points we were dealing with. Um, however, after a few iterations, um, I think it was about four or five in the end, um, of the scene file inside uh, Houdini, we did manage to build a, um, a tool for cutting these planes up. Now, the important thing here was that we needed a pipeline that would work over and over again because we knew we were going to be doing more of these projects in the future. So again, we built a HDA that would slice these... Um, these uh, point clouds up and then exploit them as useful LODs that could then be uh, placed on top, uh, instanced onto points. So just a little demo of it actually working. So this is a quick video showing what you would see in, um, in the VR headset. As you can see, we were quite pleased with the final uh, imagery that we managed to achieve and we were able to play this at 90 frames a second in VR. Um, so the lodding system worked. And also the really nice thing about the way we created the LODs in Houdini was that we were able to maintain points between LODs uh, to ensure that we didn't saw as little shimmering um, as the, they loaded in and unloaded. And 
The next project I'm going to talk about is rendering galactic ghouls. This was done in collaboration with our astronomy department and Professor Jim Geach. Uh, Professor Peter Richardson uh, of the screen department and myself. In this, uh, this was an example of how uh, the cross-disciplinary work we'd done previously had uh, reaped other benefits uh, because um, Jim had seen the work we'd been doing with point cloud um, processing in Houdini and um, so we agreed to work in collaboration to do some visualization of some uh, deep, uh, deep space data that they'd been collecting with a rather large radio telescope. And they discovered this new ne this new hourglass shaped nebula, which they coined a galactic ghoul. Um, now, the particularly interesting thing about this one was that it uh, um, pushes out a large amount of gas out the front of it, so they call it outgassing. And what we did was we were able to bring in um, a large data set from the telescope and stick it into Houdini, and we were able to render it using volumes. And again, uh, with some uh, VDB generated geometry. Um, what was particularly interesting for our astronomy um, colleagues was the ability to visualize this data very, very fast and fly through it and explore the points. Um, this is some this is a level of interaction that they don't usually get when they're dealing with um, these large point clouds, um, especially when they're processing them on a cluster supercomputer where effectively they have to send the require request off and wait for it to be processed um, whereas in Houdini we were able to open the files very quickly and spin and explore them um, and adjust settings to, to get the look just right. So for the second part of this talk I'm going to introduce you to how we teach tool design and furthermore problem solving on the digital animation program. Just to give you some background on our students, they're not from a computer science background or programming background, they're from an art background. So they've, they've been spending time learning to sketch, draw, paint, sculpt, um, animate and 3D model. Um, however, this is their first introduction to trying to uh, build their own tools or write their own code in many uh, instances. So we have several barriers to break down initially, which is firstly that they have little confidence in themselves in their ability to build tools um, because they're art students. Um, and so one thing that Houdini does for us is it gives, a because it's targeted at an arts audience for building um, artistic works, um, we're effectively in in their house so we're we're talking their language we're we're speaking about art so what we what we do is we use the houdini tool set to um, build our own tools so i'm going to take you through the process we go through in designing a tool so we take a problem-based learning approach uh, and i'm going to take you through um, a tool that we designed to um, import um, mecha blocks uh, models and set them up ready to render in Houdini. Now, the focus of this approach is to encourage students to identify um, points of friction within their own creative pipeline. So students are encouraged to look at their own uh, practice and find places where tools could be designed um, to make things run more smoothly. Um, usually I'd get them to have a notepad and say, if you've done something 15 times or more in a row, write it down. There's probably a tool there somewhere. So we identify points of frictions within their pipeline. Then they're encouraged to develop their own expertise within the technical tools of their pipeline. So in their own discipline, uh, where we suggest they do some of their own research to try and find how to build um, solutions to those problems that they've identified. And finally, that they get some understanding of user interface and user experience design so that their tools are usable without needing too much documentation. So the first stage is defining the problem. Now we often start with a very simple system view such as this. So we, in this particular tools instance, it is taking a Collada import doing something magical with Houdini and then spitting out a clean asset ready for rendering. So as you can see, we want to go from this gray box to this other gray box, but with a little bit of color um, and some information. So 
that's how detailed the initial definition is. We try to keep this relatively light. I often encourage my students to make a little recording of the process that they'd have to do manually. So for this particular example, the process involves going into each shader on the first object and writing down the color numbers and the shader name, and then going to the same brick on the final model and put setting up the shader in exactly the same way, um, but putting the data into points. Now, obviously, there's a there's a definitely a much more efficient way of doing that, and that's what this tool is going to do. And I've got a small demonstration at the end uh, video, which will show you how it's working. So the next phase we look at is we identify any interaction. So in this particular tool, we don't need much interaction. Um, it's almost headless, frankly. Um, we do. Um, we do have some places where there could be some interaction, so we could choose what kind of shader gets selected or whether the color is stored on the points or if the color's in a shader. Um, but that's something that can come as a further version because it's not needed for the basic version. We can just build one setting for now. But it's worth considering those levels of interaction now because inevitably when if the, a tool is, is not advanced enough or is missing some features, um, you've got but you've got already identified places where you can improve it. So then we break down the steps um, needed step by step. So often this is done by um, creating the, um, you know, going through the nodes and recording it step by step so you can see what you have to do. Um, and the idea is that you end up with a page of notes in plain English, um, keeping jargon to a minimum. Um, so that you can easily identify places where you've done things repetitively, which brings us on to the next point. So identifying repetition. So in this case, we knew we needed to copy the color values from the shader to the points. Um, we needed to fix some geometry. Um, we also uh, need to extract the part number um, from the file name because it's not actually stored on the geometry in the original file. Um, they just come across as part one, two, and three, whereas we want to know which brick um, model number it is so that we can line up them again later. Um, uh, so we extract the part number from the file name and store it on the geometry. And then finally, we pack it so that we can uh, maneuver these things nice and quickly when we've got lots and lots of bricks in the scene. And so the purpose of identifying the repetition is that we're looking for blocks of code that, go, that are running again and again. So in this case, we knew that we had to run this for every single brick on the source piece. So this was our first script, needless to say, was to generate this process so that we end up with all the data we need on the points. The next place was to ident identify new knowledge. At this point, we'd worked out that we got all the data onto points or we wanted to get all the data onto points. We now needed a way of actually putting the model back together once we've, we've got that data on the points. Now, we remembered vaguely hearing about a, a concept of point instancing some time ago and so um, encouraged people to go and search out how point instancing works um, and how it's used. And so the idea being that we would use this technique. So the, Id the idea within our cycle here is at this point we would then go and learn about some new technology that we haven't used before um, and build it into our tool. So in this case it's point instancing. Then we develop the solution. So you notice we've got all the way around the cycle at this point um, or without starting writing any code but we have an intimate understanding of our problem and we've, we're part of the way to understanding what the solution is. So now I'm going to take you through this segment in a slightly more detail. So developing the solution, no more flowcharts. So in previous years, before we moved to Houdini, the next stage we would do is we would then sit down and draw flowcharts of the code that needs to happen or the flow of the data that needs to go through our script. However, because Houdini can do this stuff with nodes itself, it made sense to actually build our prototype using nodes. So in the, in the example on the right here, this export Briggs, um, we just built the network, um, even though we were going to be later building it with scripts um, so that we could um, plumb all the parameters automatically. Um, and ultimately, this wouldn't actually exist in the final file. It's only an intermediary process. 
Um, but we were able to build this and this is the maximum amount of code we needed to use. There's one more line in save files, but there's not a great deal of code here. Most of this work is done with nodes. And this works in two, two things. Um, so it helps us understand what we need in there and what, um, what actually needs to happen. But secondly, it gives us, uh, it makes the students feel more like it's possible because it's, it's um, able to be done with nodes. After developing the flowchart, the next thing we do is we um, develop the solution um, into, we start taking it into code. And so the first step we do is we go through and we write down all of the nodes that we've just created in order. Um, and then I tend to put comment in to say anything that needs to happen. So it might be link this node to that or put this data in this box. The idea being that we've effectively created ourselves an English instruction manual. And again, we haven't touched any code yet. We're trying very hard to avoid mixing up the problem solving with the programming because most people already have an innate ability to do some kind of problem solving. So we don't want to mix up that with the new thing which is code in this sense so then what we do is we encode our network that we just built there's a slightly tricky bit in here because we've got some some python nodes with some code in them um, but the objective here is to effectively recreate that network we saw on the flow chart um, but with nodes uh, with code in this sense so we create ourselves a shelf tool so that we could click it and it would create the same network as before. Now obviously in some cases this might have been better created using a, a HDA um, and, of, and you can also use the, the as code function. Um, however, we, we like to keep it nice and neat so that if we needed to modify something later on, um, often it's worth writing these out manually. It also gives students a bit of practice as to how um, to address the Houdini object model so the final phase is testing your tool. Now, in this video, I'm going to show you us testing it with a far more complicated model than we initially tested with, uh, mainly because it's more interesting to see um, the complicated one. Um, however, in our, in our real world scenario, we um, would have tested with a smaller model first. Um, but what we do is we're going to run through the process and what I usually do is I encourage students to ask their peers um, to test their tool preferably with no instructions um, to see how well it uh, makes it um, how well it is to understand now I have sped up some portions of this video because quite a lot of time um, is used in <laughs> importing the initial file I think I timed it by a, a um, 10 times the speed actually at this point um, but this is bringing in all of the lego models uh, the lego bricks on the whole of the hogwarts castle so it takes a little while and as you can see the performance of the um, the scene is very poor at this stage because um, this is not uh, packed geometry at the moment um, so that was another thing we were trying to address here was to make the scenes actually more um, workable i mean to be fair houdini did handle the large amount of geometry very quick, very well once it actually loaded it into the scene. Um, but it was consuming a fair amount of the RAM on this machine to do it. So as you can see, the model is gray at the moment with no shaders on it. And so at this point, we're going to um, run the first tool, which will um, generate the point information. So we've got a very simple interface for this one. We're able to select the Collada scene and press go. And then we wait a moment while it um, does its job. And so it's going through all of those bricks and it's transferring the color, the part number and everything. And as you can see, it's done the first stage now. Um, and we can verify that that's done the job. We also included some code in there to deal with transparencies because um, the materials themselves didn't have any transparency data. However, on looking at the original data set, some of the bricks um, had um, color numbers that said that they were going to be transparent so we were able to use python there to um, so just pick the ones that were going to be transparent and uh, apply that um, transparency or alpha channel for us I apparently took a very long time in writing the file name 
um, and then we're going to run part two. Now part two is going to um, export all of those, it's going to export all of the unique bricks from the, uh, that resulted from part one, um, so that we've got a collection of standard bricks that we can then point instance in part three. These are all being saved out as BGO files. And this means also that our Houdini scene opens nice and quickly now. So we went from about a two gigabyte um, Houdini scene down to 17 megabytes after it had been point instanced um, because we've got the, all of the uh, geometry in BGO. So I'm just showing now I'm hiding both of those and then I'm going to get the instanced model. So this is using the um, object instancer. Um, so it's placed inside a subnet. We've got an instance here and there, and it's also generated um, all of the bricks inside it. And as you can see, it's all ready to go. We've also shaded it with the um, uh, Mantra principled shader, so it's ready for rendering. As you can see, the transparent bricks are working as well. And the final stage, is that we can now delete the original import because it's no longer needed. One of the things we built into the instancer is that it actually exports the point cloud as a BGO as well, so that once it's done, we just need the, the collection of BGO files. We no longer need the Collada cache. And then I've just set up a very quick render um, with an environment light and a direct light. And as you can see, without any further adjustments, we've got quite a nice render come out of it um, from our original Collada file. And so that's a very quick introduction to the um, Lego importer tool that we worked on. Um, the final stage that um, after testing is to then identify any future um, features that you'd want to add. Uh, so in this case, um, we were suggesting that it might be useful to have alternative renderers. So if we've got different shaders that we need to use, um, whether we wanted to make it destructible or have some kind of um, ability to remove some of the points so you could see into the model. Um, and also, for some cases, people wanted to be able to choose the, um, the color themselves for bricks. Uh, and so actually putting the color back out into shaders was um, useful instead of uh, putting it in a color point as well. So just a final slide, and this is another render we did from it. Um, and so just a quick thanks to Mechabricks for their site, um, where all AFOLs can build models to their heart's desire. Um, uh, without it, we wouldn't have been able to um, build these projects. So that's been uh, much appreciated. And if you like building Lego as much as we do, um, please do support their site. And they're on Patreon, I believe. Um, thanks to um, Mechabricks users, uh, Jeff and Stas, for building the models. Um, and thank you, everybody, for listening. <laughs>